Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Nice to virtually meet you. Let me move my camera. While we're waiting for Veronica to join, I'll just uh, briefly unmute myself so that you know we're here waiting together. Veronica, are you ready? Yeah, there we go. You did. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I think that I think that Riff will also be joining us, so perhaps we can wait one moment for Riff to join. Uh, let's see, Riff, if you can uh, see us, um, I believe that you click on the podium and turn on your camera to join. Uh, so let's wait one minute, perhaps, and uh, Jan Willem, John, and uh, Vikash, if you are able to help set that up. Um, can wait a moment. Just to say um, to Riff that he just needs to switch his camera and microphone on to the, the, the big icons at the bottom of the screen. He is in as a speaker, I can see him on the list, so he should be able to be visible. I didn't quite. Did it, did anybody else hear that? I, I I heard a little piece of it. Um, yeah, Riff, if you can just turn on your uh, camera, webcam, and your mic, you'll be on screen, on the stage. Okay, well, you know, I can go ahead and introduce the panel and uh, the session, and then um, hopefully uh, the technical issues will come together in the next minute or so. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, so happy that you're here with us. Uh, let me just organize my screen here. Um, uh, I would like to welcome you to um, the industry sessions uh, at Prob Prague, as well as this panel. Fixing my screen here, screen share here, just a quick moment. Uh, uh, so this is one of uh, three industry events that we'll be having having at uh, at Prog Prog this year in our virtual um, virtual format. Um, my name is Veronica Weiner, um, and uh, uh, I'm uh, coming from MIT, uh, the Probabilistic Computing Project. Um, so our industry events include this panel, we have another one tomorrow morning, and then a developer meetup this afternoon. Uh, for those industry events, for the times and locations or how to join, um, you can check Jan Willem's email yesterday. Um, and I hope that we'll all get a lot out of the, uh, these industry events in the new virtual setting. So this is one of two panels. Uh, the, in this panel, we'll, in both of them, we'll discuss probabilistic programming in the field. I know that many of the attendees here are very interested in applications of the research we're discussing that are being field tested or they're being deployed. Um, and so all of the panelists, um, all of you who are joining us have uh, backgrounds um, in either small or large organizations um, in a variety of, of, small, of um, small and large software platforms for your use cases. And um, all of you here um, enjoy a, a great deal of respect in the community um, and and, and among um, our peers when it comes to having knowledge to share about applications and deployments in specifics. So I'm very excited to, uh, to chat with you and I, I believe that everybody um, else will be happy um, to hear about your experiences as well. So uh, do we have, let's see, have we fixed the technical issues? Uh, we do not. It's coordinating, um, but um, you wrote okay. in the chat. Okay. Yeah, Riff will be here momentarily. I suggest that you go ahead and get started. Sure, so we'll get started. So um, as to format, I will briefly introduce uh, 
each of you in just a few sentences. And then the very first question uh, will give more space to describe uh, the particular work that you're doing in the very next question. So um, a brief intro, um, and then we'll dive into what you are working on. Uh, so I'll start with myself, um, moderator on this one, and a panelist as well. Uh, so currently, I'm directing special projects uh, at the MIT Probabilistic Computing Project, also managing partner of a small company with Vikash. Um, and my applications experience of Bayesian models um, are a pretty wide range. Um, I've worked with teams to apply probabilistic program in uh, retail banking, uh, biopharmaceutical manufacturing, investment, human resources analytics. Uh, this year, focused on clinical trial monitoring, um, worked on customer service and a nat natural language application, and a few more. The approach that I focus on is um, automated Bayesian data modeling approaches, and I work closely with uh, probabilistic programming language developer teams, uh, including uh, Oli, who's here with us as well, who, are, who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, so moving on to all of you, um, uh, in uh, alphabetical order, um, we have uh, Nim Aurora uh, coming from, from Facebook currently. So um, Nim has told me that he's somebody who likes to study when and why generative approaches work better than discriminative approaches and has built probabilistic programming-based models at Facebook, at the United Nations, and is a certifiable Bayesian, um, uh, having won the Mitchell Prize by the International Society for Bayesian Analysis. Um, we uh, were very pleased to invite him because he's done work in probabilistic programs for about 10 years or so over a very long duration. Um, and um, one of my colleagues, uh, when it comes to deployed work, wrote that his work on the on deploying um, probabilistic programming in the context of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is one of the most unambiguously morally positive applications of probabilistic AI I've seen. Um, and, and NIM has an experience of working in, in different flavors of, of applications at the Test Ban Treaty and at Facebook. Um, so uh, Daniel Lee, many of you know, um, as one of the uh, original STAN developers and, and tech leads, uh, for Stan, who's, who's worked on the project since 2011. Um, Daniel is now co-founder and CTO of Generable, um, and so developing a lot of uh, experience field testing and, and industrial uh, deployments of, of industrial applications focused on estimating the effects of oncology treatments and early phase trial data. Um, Generable is based in New York. Daniel is an alum of MIT in Cambridge, um, worked with Andrew Gelman at Columbia for eight years, um, and has experience in many applications with Stan, baseball player evaluation, pricing, quality control, political polling, um, pharm pharmacometrics, and more. Um, and so uh, very happy to, to have Daniel here to discuss this topic. Uh, Lawrence Murray um, is a senior research scientist at Uber AI. Uh, interests include computational statistics, machine learning, probabilistic programming, high performance computing. Um, Lawrence is a developer of number of, of programming, uh, probabilistic programming language, um, uh, high multiple generations of high performance probabilistic programming systems. Um, these incurred, include Birch and, uh, is it pronounced Libby or Libby? I'm not sure, but um, has um, developed epidemiological models in those, which is very important this year. I know many of us are very excited to speak with Lawrence um, because of Lawrence's work at Uber, which is one of the most interesting uh, examples of field testing and deployment of PPLs uh, today. Um, very important company and application, uh, much of that with the Pyro team. So um, uh, I would like to introduce Riff, but perhaps I'll wait until Riff um, is able to join uh, in a moment. Oh, good. Perfectly on time, Riff. Just about to introduce you. So uh, we, we have Riff Asaurus, uh, who um, is a research director at Google, has been at Google since 2007, so one of the very longest um, experiences in this type of work. Many of us know Riff as a TensorFlow probability lead, uh, leading the probabilistic machine learning group um, that advances research and development on the open source TensorFlow probability library. Um, and and um, Riff has some very important uh, deployed organizational wins at Google. These include uh, recommendations and discovery for Google Play Music, um, an ultrasonic proximity system, um, and has also a lot of experience founding uh, teams of researchers and developers, um, including for audio event detection, um, quite a bit of speech work. Um, so uh, a really a great expert on uh, applications and deployments. Um, and last, Oli, um, 
very happy to have here. Oli and I work closely at MIT. We do very complementary work. A lot of the applied and field testing work I do involves uh, software uh, um, that Oli is, is the tech lead for. Oli is a research scientist at MIT, um, Ulrich Schechtel, um, and uh, is, is the tech lead for the Inference QL platform. Um, Oli also leads uh, our applied work for DARPA um, in a very interesting project about synthetic biology design. Uh, it's called SD2, Synergistic Discovery and Design. Um, and for that, actually, it's one of the top uh, uh, 50 early career scientists recognized by DARPA, DARPA Riser, which is really great. Um, Oli and I are both leading and focused on um, some automated Bayesian data modeling for uh, a clinical trials application this year that, um, so we've been thinking a lot about applications and deployments. So with those intros, I will, um, I will now um, open our, our first question um, and uh, give, give each of you uh, the chance to uh, talk a little bit more about your work, um, uh, specifically uh, your use cases. So the first question is, what use cases have you been targeting in your organization for um, building and testing Bayesian data models in a field? And for those, where did probabilistic programming help the most? Uh, would Somebody like to jump in? I'm. I'm. Just go ahead and un unmute yourself, yeah, or can, if anybody wants to chat. Am I echoing? Can I? Can you, can you hear me? Okay, Veronica. Awesome. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, and really honored to share uh, a uh, panel with so many amazing people. It's really cool. Uh, yeah. In terms of applications, some of the big ones that we've been looking at over the last couple of years, uh, we've been do looking a lot at uh, Bayesian bandits for optimization. So there's a group that does web campaigns for Google and basically you know, choosing between different settings. And so we've been deploying a, a Bayesian bandits set of, uh, a set of Bayesian bandits to kind of automatically uh, adapt and learn those campaigns. Uh, another big one for us has been a Bayesian structural time series models. So these are models where you know, users can specify things like local trends, linear trends, et cetera. And we have that deployed you know, automatically serving large numbers of internal data analysis users inside Google. Uh, there's some other areas that are a little bit more forward looking and more speculative. Uh, I think for us, a big one right now is developing a workflow for large MCMC problems. So think about you know, stand style problems, but really uh, doing those at very large scale using TPUs and similar. So that's something we're pretty actively engaged in. And then uh, one last one I'll mention briefly that is you know, a little bit formative for us, but there's a lot of interest in this inside Google. Um, I would call it generally the area of uncertainty quantification. So we've been very much living in the era of deep nets and models that are making point estimates. And many of the users of these models are realizing that they really want to have some kind of handle on the uncertainty of predictions coming out of those models. So I think those are a few of the things we've been working a lot on lately. Thanks, Rev. Yes, it sounds like a, a interesting range, range of current and more speculative work. Um, I would like to pass to Lawrence because um, I understand that there are some time series applications at Uber as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mean, I could have almost said the same as Rift there. Time series, uh, Bayesian optimization plays a big role. Bandits are occurring. Uh, one thing I'd add is causal inference, um, which is sort of increasingly. Uh, I think as we sort of move, you know, causal inference is usually done on aggregate. I think when you start disaggregating your data into sort of like individuals, for example, and how they how they respond to incentives, say, um, you start getting into this very stochastic space where probabilistic modeling can help. Uh, so those are yeah similar kind of areas where we've been exploring um, probabilistic modeling and and PPLs. I think what I, I the, a good way of framing it is just that the scale is massive. And, and trying to, you know, I, I think just to sort of paint uh, a bit of a picture of what Uber's ecosystem looks like, our uh, machine learning platform handles two, about 2 million queries per second to machine learning models, right? This, this is everything from, you know, uh, routing for drivers to um, ETA predictions, all sorts of things, you know. And, and that's a network of models or an ecosystem of models, right? The output of one model becomes the input of another model. And one, I think one of the challenges for probabilistic machine learning and then and probabilistic programming is how do you just replace one of those models, right? It, it needs to be incremental. You can't just replace the whole tech stack with a Bayesian approach and probabilistic models, right? It's just, it's just too big. So one, I think one of the key challenges we have is how does a probabilistic model interact with other models, right? And so just like, what does that look like? Some other model wants a point prediction and your model gives a distribution as output. 
playing. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to derail, but I would love to ask a follow-up question on that or dive into it a tiny bit. Um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we found is definitely around a similar issue, which is that a lot of the systems we have at Google, to be honest, are like a mix of you know moderately principled you know point estimate machine learning systems combined with uh, I guess the euphemism would be heuristics. I was going to say hacks, and I think what you often find is that when you replace one part of that system with a higher quality more principled approach, you can often find that the performance of the entire system degrades. And so that leads to some big challenges to adoption. So I'd love to hear, you know, maybe in answer to the question how other people have addressed that. Or yes, yeah, I, could... I, I would love to um, uh, ask uh, Daniel, Nim, and, and Uli to um, say something briefly about, about their use cases. And then I think it would be great to talk more about um, the uh, architecture uh, challenges that you you both described, Riff and, and Lawrence, after that. Um, so I will hand it to to Nim, who's, who's I'm curious if some of these scale issues are um, are relevant to your work at Facebook, also. And then I know that um, Oli and, and Daniel and I have worked at some things that are smaller scale, also, um, still quite important problems. So we can um, briefly describe those. But let's start with with Nim. So I would like to address this question of uh, pipelines of machine learning models built upon each other and with heuristics and hacks in there. Um, so I, I think that's a perfect segue of some of the work that I did for the comprehensive test ban free organization, because when we began working for them, it was exactly that. They had this pipeline of deep learning models that were classifying incoming signals from you know, global worldwide sensors. And you know they have a massive scale data set coming in as well in real time. Uh, what we realized is that these the initial pipelines had like 99% accuracy. And so that may sound great, but then you, if you start thinking about where the biases of that 1% failure rates are coming in, it turned out that that 1% failure rate in these deep learning models were actually causing 10% of real seismic events to be missed by the rest of the processing pipeline. So when we went in, one of the things we did uh, was we said, okay, we'll build a Bayesian model that actually includes both aspects, both what, what they call data cleaning as well as the inference. Because ultimately the artifacts that we are seeing in the data cleaning are important signals for the Bayesian inference, the Bayesian model to use to build a more holistic picture. Because you know, most of these deep learning models, they're making localized decisions. But when you are making a Bayesian model of events, you can take the predictions of the lower level detections as just inputs to your model and you can build a build, bigger model that can actually correct these uh, errors in a global context. So that was in fact, one of the key, uh, again, it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what makes a Bayesian model succeed, but that was one of the things that we felt made a, a key distinction. Um, and I think in very similarly in Facebook, we have uh, applications and in integrity, you know, where, you know, we, are classifying billions of uh, contents like every like, every you know post uh, as uh, under, under hundreds of different machine learning categories, right? And a lot of these are fairly accurate, but they're not well calibrated. And so what we, when we are trying to take all of this data and then trying to make some inference that we have to report to let's say regulatory bodies, like what is the percentage of, of fake news or election interference attempts going on right now, we cannot just take the raw signals from the machine learning models. We need to build a more holistic model that takes the raw signal, takes the human curated uh, samples on some of the raw signal. And, and that's kind of what we build also at Facebook. So it's kind of interesting that, uh, that there are very common themes as to when a Bayesian model turns out, or seems to work better when you can, um, I'll just summarize in one sentence, you can take localized decisions from ML models and make global decisions that take signals from different models together. So, and maybe that's a good summary of some of the use cases that I'm working on. That's very, very interesting. I, um, I think that sounds very familiar, uh, this, uh, this setting where when, when one moves uh, into deploying applications and working with the, these real use cases, uh, at least I find myself with uh, a need to combine techniques from uh, the discriminative world and the, um, the Bayesian world try to make everything entirely uh, using the Bayesian toolkit, there is a, a performance degradation. Um, and I, I've seen that as well. I, I, would, I would like to hear from uh, Daniel um, next, who um, 
are, are your use cases um, at, at this sort of scale? Because I think that you're in this setting, as you've described, um, that might be a certain number of medium data or smaller data problems. So I'm curious uh, to what extent you can have this a pure, purely Bayesian uh, approach um, or uh, these sort of mixed approaches that, that have been described. Yeah, we're, we're on the complete other end where data is very small. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to squeeze out as much information out of the data that we can. Um, so the setting that we work in is uh, we analyze clinical trials um, specifically for oncology treatments in early phase data. So you're talking about 10 to 30 patients and you're trying to estimate how the um, treatment would do when you extend it to 300 patients. Um, and we work a lot with uh, medical people and biologists to, to really estimate to really build a model that's complex and explains as much as we can. Um, and, you know, everything's hierarchical. We borrow information from other trials, other other categories of things, and, and try to make that as um, understandable and explainable as possible. So we're, we're on the opposite end where we don't have that much data. We won't get that much more data. Cancer patients aren't just like, you know, we can't experiment on them forever. So. Um, and, you know, just like any other startup, we actually went, we started in 2017, uh, not having the pharma focus and we tried applying it to different use cases. That's where all the different use cases came up and we ended up in pharma because it ended up being a particularly good example of where Bayesian estimates are, are pretty good here. Yeah. That, I, uh, that is a perfect segue to, um, some of the work, um, Oli uh, and, and myself are focusing on. Um, I think that Oli has had a very similar experience in, in clinical trial uh, uh, clinical trial mod monitoring applications. Oli, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, similar, but maybe even more extreme as, as Daniel described that uh, uh, I, I work in a university, so we don't have these industrial applications with huge amount of data and massive pipelines, but instead uh, we're focusing on trying to make a difference with automated Bayesian data modeling and probabilistic programming uh, for scientific and, uh, uh, and civic use cases. Specifically, if I had to summarize it, I'd, um, Let's see, like three different application areas. Uh, one is, as Veronica mentioned, also clinical trials, um, also oncology currently, currently, uh, uh, funny enough, um, but I think a little bit later stage. And specifically here, what we're looking into is probabilistic anomaly detection um, via automated Bayesian data analysis, analysis and probabilistic programming. Um, another thrust, the second thrust is um, detecting heterogeneously typed high dimensional conditional interactions as somebody who would design a more classical experiment uh, uh, would think about. Um, but focusing not, you know, specifically on causal inference, but like trying to pick up a little bit of the lower hanging fruit and trying to understand um, uh, independence uh, in, in more complex settings. Um, we have one application that, that works on this on, on synthetic biology, where we work with um, domain experts who uh, engineer um, different strains of bacteria. Um, and then finally, the third sort of like application of the technology that I would say is um, uh, future learning and the application to probabilistic search, um, where the idea is that you could, you know, like if you don't know really yet what you're looking for, wouldn't it be nice that, you know, you add a little bit of data to an existing model and um, try to make predictions about like, you know, how, uh, you know, a small set of labels, like how would they behave in other scenario uh, in, in other scenarios. Um, and this is like more, more civic use case, for example, we applied this to data journalism. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I think that having had uh, an overview of um, folks' use cases, it, it would be interesting to circle back um, to some of the questions or some of the discussion about technical challenges, um, technical opportunities. And I, I think it may be interesting to talk about this two ways. One, um, maybe to discuss uh, architectures um, and, and the tooling that may be involved in uh, modular architectures uh, that um, use uh, the probabilistic programming approach and then shift over to inference quality, which is something that I know a lot of people have interest in. 
Um, so, so for the first question um, about architectures, uh, there has been um, uh, this, this promise of probabilistic programming that the modularity of our languages um, would allow helpful software constructs like uh, unit tests and um, deployments where pieces could be swapped in and out, um, and that th there would be some sort of maintainability uh, um, and uh, you know strong software culture in in the PPL setting that might be somewhat different from machine learning or data science workflows. I would be curious um, to what extent this promise has been borne out, and if what new research or what new tooling um, anybody thinks might be needed to to deliver on that idea. Um, and, and perhaps some of the folks who've worked on larger systems um, at the big tech uh, style organizations may have some thoughts about that. I went first last time, so if someone else wants to go first, I'll. Yeah, I, I can step in. Um, so I, I don't think I have good answers for this, actually. I, I mean, I think we design our own systems to be sort of internally modular and coherent. Uh, some of the challenges I see more so are the external systems that you need to integrate with, right, at scale. That, that unfortunately, you know, not everyone wrote their model in in your language or something like that. And so, I think that requires a, a bit more of a um, almost a theoretical study. I mean, I, I've done some work before on modularization of Bayesian models. Um, other people have as well, like Martin Plummer, for example. Things like cut models um, that occurred in. I think Jags and Bugs had these sort of cut ideas where you, um, this, this idea is, is that you sort of uh, have a one way flow of information along your graphical model, edges of your graphical model, if you like, that might allow you to scale um, to some extent. So yeah, th those are perhaps, I think, the areas where some more work is needed to, to, to make sure that, you know, probabilistic models fit into the ecosystem, if you like, uh, even if internally they're written in languages that are very modular. Yes, that's a good point. So, I mean, I... Um, and that's that's just... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I can go next. I, I personally feel that I really haven't seen much of, uh, uh, of an impact to unit testing and modularity uh, in terms of, hey, you know, you have a large probabilistic program, you can test each part of it separately. Mainly because a lot of uh, what a probabilistic program specifies is very closely tied with the quality of the inference engine that can be uh, attached to that probabilistic program. So taking a module of a program out and doing something with it is is not a very clear-cut notion to me. What One thing we, we do do for this kind of a, for testing purposes is, that, is we do have various versions of a model from coarse to fine where we will start with a much more coarser model and then we'll add the final, make it maybe add a level of hierarchy to share information and then then see if we can actually, our inference engines can still keep up with it and find at the point where, you know, the complexity of the model is too much for inference to handle. And, and you know, add unit tests around the coarser versions and then and work with that. But that's the closest I can get to that. Yeah. Um... So first of all, I would say I'm not sure that we've been taking advantage of like modularity within probabilistic programs themselves, because I think the honest fact is we don't write very large probabilistic programs most of the time. I think a lot of the models we end up writing are fairly small. You can even write small models that are hard to do inference in. Uh, that said, I want to call out a couple of things that have been really relevant to us in the area of testing. So at the lowest level of our system are probability distributions, which are the basic building blocks of probability. And we take our work there very seriously, and it's not easy to get right. And one thing that's really helped us there is property-based testing. So we make extensive use of the Python hypothesis library, which is a derivative of Haskell's quick check. And we use that to automatically find numerical problems in our distributions and how they fit together. And I'd like to specifically call out Alexi Radul, who really uh, pioneered that work in our group, and it's been very valuable for us. So you know, that's kind of one area where I think about it hard. I'll also say that we benefit a lot from being on top of TensorFlow. So a lot of the accelerability and scaling issues, when we have those, we work closely with the TensorFlow team. And so there's a kind of modularity for us, which is the TensorFlow is providing, uh, you would call it co compiler architecture, basically. Right, they're providing a substrate which is fast execution and it doesn't always work right we've had a lot of challenges with it we've had to work with them a lot but that modularity of splitting the system into our piece which is essentially about probabilistic modeling with the tensorflow systems and runtimes which are an attempt to do fast execution and that's been kind of a modularity we've really benefited from and in some sense bet on from the very beginning 
Can I just add that? I think that idea of, you know, separating that's, that's the front-end language yeah. from the back-end platform is really quite valuable in, um, in many ways. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, that was you, actually what I was thinking. I think it's well. a little bit of a different perspective to, uh, as opposed to think of modularity in terms of inference or the inerts of the model, but instead sort of like the surface Plat surface API to probabilistic programs, I think is a little bit underappreciated even in the community where um, if you just made surface languages that make it easy to do a bunch of common operations um, for users such as conditioning and marginalization and information theoretic queries, I think at least like for the scientific use cases and the, you know, like the, the clinical use cases and the healthcare use cases that I'm interested in, I think you would add a lot of values to the users because i mean and the truth <laughs> is that in, in, in like years of trying to apply this to different problems i don't think i met a single sort of like person who brought me data on a problem who really had a concise question that i could just code up and solve you know and then that was it normally they have a bunch of questions they don't know yet what they want to know they know roughly what is in their data they have intuition what is there but they wouldn't come to me for help if they you know if they could just you know, pay a statistician consultant to handcraft a model that just does exactly what they want, period, that's it. Um, and, but so it, I'm interested in these like higher level surface languages where you expose those uh, primitives and understanding what those primitives even are that allow uh, to ask users to ask basic questions about uncertainty. Um, what's the probability of a certain event happen given that, you know, you know a bunch of other things uh, about, the data point of interest. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like uh, many in the community, as to use to use Rift's language, are taking bets on uh, the efficiencies or the like the maintainability benefits that come from um, of the software architecture, even as probabilistic programming is is growing, um, uh, and how well we can do that uh, and how easily we can. Uh, given the time, I would I would like to spend maybe three or four minutes on inference quality, a few minutes on benchmarks, um, and then wrap up. Um, so um, for inference quality, this is uh, a challenging uh, a challenging problem to folks who, who deploy um, things in the real world. Um, and inference quality testing can be challenging. My question is, how do you personally evaluate your models prior to deployment? Um, and maybe we can start with uh, Daniel. Um, uh, who, who, um, yeah, um, this is this is important for us. Like we care a lot about not only inference quality, but um, I mean, there's there's inference quality, like whether or not the inference algorithms can actually find um, parameters that make sense, but also whether or not the models make sense themselves. And we're always going back and forth and um, just iterating again and again. Um, I mean, we do everything in a Bayesian setting, um, mostly because our models are hierarchical and we know that if you do optimization over those, you're gonna end up with nonsensical uh, variance parameters that are zero, um, which we know shouldn't be possible. And since we have a small data set, we're just pushing the boundaries of, of what, how complex our models are. And this sort of goes to Namar's um, point, we, we start, we just, build a course model and just keep refining and refining and refining it. Um, we're still in this point where there's like no turning back. There's no formal model selection for us because every improvement we make is actually a large jump. Um, there's, there's another bit of biology that we've incorporated that makes more sense the last bit that we had. We, incorpor we didn't incorporate um, censored data or we didn't know something about the measurement error um, of the thing. And now we bring it in and that, you know, there's, there's just, yeah. So we, we check the inference quality, we check the model, we just iterate back and forth for us. That's interesting. I, I would love to hear um, from Lawrence about that. Um, at, at an uh, quality control. Scale. Um, yeah, inference quality, um, or you could answer about quality yeah, control. Yeah, this, this uh, one's uh, 
this is, in general. This is hard. I'm not even sure I have, uh, you know, answers to this that are, that are good. I mean, I think it starts, you know, you bake in with your basic sort of unit tests, integration tests and so forth for all the basics. I mean, as Riff was describing, start at the distribution level, right, and make sure all those things are working well. You have thorough tests there. I think uh, inference quality. So for me, like personally, in my sort of work, um, I stick with Monte Carlo methods. Um, I, that's sort of my bread and butter. And so inference quality for me is actually variance, not accuracy, right? I'm, I, I already know my method is consistent in, in the results that I get. I just need to get the variance down. And, and mostly because I work in SMC methods, it's like normalizing constant variance. And I've got this nice number that just sort of tells me, you know, it's a nice summary of the quality of the inference that I'm getting out. I, I think, um, I sort of then at scale, you know, it, it comes down to um, a lot, lot of A/B testing actually, and I think this sort of gets a little bit neglected in the in the research community. Um, I love to harp on about MNIST. Can I do that for a moment? Which is you know, sort of, you know, like a really overused yeah. benchmark that you know, like how many times has that test set been looked at? that's not really a test set anymore, right? Like you train your data, you train your model on the training set and you train yourself on the test set over many, many years, right? Uh, whereas when you, like the real quality is like a brand new test set and something like an AB test, you can't cheat it, right? You have to come up with a model that can go in the wild next week, ingesting new data that's from a real time stream is outputting to another real-time stream that other models are ingesting and the whole thing might fall apart, right? I mean, you, you really need to do some, uh, you need a red button to stop it if necessary, if the thing doesn't work. Um, but you know, that comes down to really you know, being really rigorous with your experimental process uh, and, and making sure that um, you know, you're, you're being very honest in the assessments of your model um, and, and what you can expect out of, uh, out of an A-B test, right? Um, so those are, yeah, I don't know, I don't, maybe I'm talking more about challenges rather than solutions, but, but these are certainly, uh, certainly considerations. Well, I, I think that the, there are many uh, challenges uh, currently that, that folks are facing, so I think that's a great place. Um, you, you, you touched on benchmarks, and I, I would like to ask a, a final question about that, but before I go to that, um, any other yeah, comments like about inference quality? I'd like to just address that a, briefly here. I think learning. there's a difference between inference quality and model quality. I mean, so you may have a great model for a particular problem or a terrible model. I, I don't think, I think that's a separate question. We kind of want to separate those out totally. And we say, okay, you know, somebody comes up with a model. Our job as a inference library developer, I mean, forget our Bayesian hats of the consulting and the model side, is just to make sure that our inference engine can do very well by that model. And that is a question that we can objectively answer and in many cases, even without having ground truth or how well the model works. And in fact, we have very, very carefully formalized that procedure because we get you know, dozens of models. I mean, we get a new model every week that we need to evaluate and make sure that we can handle accurately. So I can just briefly touch on a couple of things that we do before we move on. So the most common thing I think which, you know, has been popularized by Stan effectively is the effective sample size metric. But I would just, caution that that can only be used once you are sure that your uh, MCMC inference has converged. And so we do a lot of uh, uh, testing of predictive log likelihoods on held out data, and we analyze the growth curve of that to see at what point we can be reasonably sure across different data sets that this model after these many samples is converged. And so we only measure those diagnostics after that point. And when we deploy in the field, we ensure that we get at least that many samples and things like that. So those are just basic uh, quality control techniques. Interesting, yeah. It, it sounds like there's a fair amount of uh, customized uh, experiments um, that are designed um, sort of in a, in a customized way per, per use case, per organization. Um, so uh, maybe uh, just for a couple of minutes, two minutes or so, if someone has a particularly um, strong opinion, maybe um, Riff, who, who works uh, again at scale, um, are there sufficient benchmark data sets in probabilistic programming? Uh, what's missing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly think that um, do better. I, I think that there are not sufficient benchmark data sets at scale. Um, we actually have something we want to share. Can I just put a link in the general chat? Does that work? Yeah, so I wanted to share something sure. developed by some folks in our org that we call uh, the inference gym. 
uh, developed by uh, Pavel Sansov and Alexei Radul again. And this is meant to be kind of a library of problems mm -hmm. and benchmarks that you can run inference algorithms against and compare things. So this is meant to be hopefully a community effort where we can uh, work together to you know have more benchmarks and share them around and you know know how different inference algorithms work on them. So you know we're pretty excited about this, and I hope that people will use it. Uh, coming back to the bigger questions around scale, because like what I've described in the inference gym is, is, is you know, as Nimar pointed, like once you have the model, talking about inference in the model is a pretty well-defined problem. But the bigger problem of understanding about your inference uh, is not very well-defined, right? And so what we find, for instance, is that when we're working with big deployments, right, there's always a customer involved who is not our team, who's the main owner of what's going on. And so, you know, working closely with those people can be very tough. And you know, in some cases, it's, there are real challenges. Like, you know, we've worked with, like on our time series application, we worked with a, you know, a client around a previous version and they had downstream clients who had actually adapted to the errors in the previous version. So you could have a version that was more accurate, but if it didn't make the same errors, they were less happy with it. And so like in these client applications, it's always gonna be very idiosyncratic and there'll be difficult challenges to handle, but you know, we do the best we can. I think the ideas Neymar and uh, everyone else have mentioned are excellent. Can I also add? Very good. Okay, so um, last four minutes. Can I quickly, quickly add a way to that? Oh, um, sorry, just, sorry to interrupt everyone. Oh, sure. I, I was, we have just a yeah, minute to wrap up. It looks like Yamalam is joining us. I was just the fact that there's questions from the session. audience. So maybe we could take a question or two from the audience as well. Oh, I did not see any come through. But yes, very happy to take some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, Young Willem, if you. If you have uh, so such a question, I'm not seeing one. There's a Q&A tab on the right. Um, and um, let's see. Uh, so one of the questions is, could we hear more about tactics for incremental adoption of probabilistic components into pre-existing data modeling pipelines? I can probably comment on this. Um, I, I think one, uh, one thing we're sort of looking at is you can always turn so there's some quantity of interest. You have a deterministic model that is doing some predictions of that quantity of interest. You can always change the output of that model to predict the parameters of a distribution over that quantity of interest, right? That's one like just simple example of a, like a tiny little incremental change, which is kind of what I'm getting at, that then gives you a probabilistic output. I think handling the input, like turning that distribution into the input for another model uh, is really use, use case specific. You know, do you produce the mean, the median, some other quantile? You know, it, you can. You, there are various things you can do, but so I, I guess what I'm saying is you can go to like a probabilistic model before you go to Bayesian inference, right? So don't necessarily um, confuse the two. Um, and, and the starting point I think is something probabilistic, and then moving on to more probabilistic inference methods that quantify uncertainty and so forth. That's one tactic. For another, uh, another. Oh, sorry. Shall we ask one more question? Is, what the top, the one that's getting the top number of votes? What is the one PPL feature or research idea that you think currently? I could speak to that. Um, I, I think uh, uh, a lot of so my previous work has been a lot on open universe modeling, and I have seen that there hasn't been that much uh, follow up work around that uh, in. And in general, models that involve discrete variables and continuous variables, those are, you know, or with identity uncertainty is a much harder layer on top of it. Those don't get enough attention. I know that there is, for example, one paper in this conference on divide, conquer, and combine, which I think is in the right direction. But I, I personally feel there's a lot more that one can do in dealing with identity uncertainty and a mixture of discrete and continuous variables. Those are the kinds of things that really help us express human knowledge as, as to how we reason about the world and not having uh, a good support for PPLs for that area makes it very, very hard to, you know, to really scale beyond some of the models that we are currently been talking about here. Great. Uh, would, would anybody like to name one more feature? I would like to, yeah. Yeah, so I want to say, first of all, that TFP yeah. in its current form, and by the way, I think we're kind of changing the name from TensorFlow probability to TFP because we actually work on JAX and TensorFlow now, so um, TFP maybe now stands for tensor-friendly probability okay. unofficially. Uh, 
I want to say that TFP is not a uh, universal probabilistic programming language. You know, we don't really handle open universe problems at all, um, or at least we don't handle them effectively or efficiently. And I think for me, that leads to kind of a bigger, more important research area, which is how can we improve the dynamicism of our models? So TFP, we really bet on, you know, what you'd call rectangular array processing, because that's what TensorFlow is good at. It's where neural nets are strong. And there's a very natural, uh, interplay between that and the kinds of hardware acceleration platforms we have that allow, you know, inference at scale in the late, you know, 2020, in 2020. Uh, I don't think those models are the final future, or I want them to not be the final future. I guess if you're watching, if you're watching deep nets closely, you might say they are the final future because transformers are going to do everything, everything you wanted. Uh, but if you think they're not, you know, I would really love to see more research into more dynamic kinds of models and algorithms and how we can add a little bit more dynamicism, dynamicism to what we're doing without giving up a lot of the efficiency that we get from hardware acceleration. And, and just a real practical approach here that people don't do enough of is actually using the model to simulate data, to refit the model, to make sure you're having the right thing. If you don't know that trick, it's not a trick, just do it. I know, uh, Oli, we've, we've been looking at some similar approaches too. Yeah, from there. Well, it looks like we're about out of time. Um, I would like to close um, and uh, ask if there's any call to action that you may have for our audience of uh, 125 here. Um, if anybody has um, uh, something that you would like people to take a look at or a team to join, um, and if you don't, it's okay. I personally would like to uh, invite people to our developer meetup um, later today, and you can check Jan Willem's email for details. There will be roundtables. Uh, to discuss with developers. And then tomorrow morning, we'll have another panel like this one about complex simulators. Um, anybody else have a, a call I do to have action? a call to action. <laughs> uh, and this may seem a little weird coming right after Riff's call, previous uh, mention of Inference Gym. I think Inference Gym is a great uh, benchmark. We looked at it very carefully. Uh, in Facebook, we are launching today a, a benchmarking framework called PPL Bench. And I'll just include the link to that to our AI blog post that's available on GitHub. And uh, there's a lot of documentation on that as well. <laughs> uh, my call to action. I'm sorry for doing this. It's OK, because I'm, I'm about to do a call to action for a uh, meta benchmarking framework where we can benchmark the benchmarking framework. So I'm, my call to action is for someone to build it. OK. Anyway. My I'm recommendation sure. to people in the, uh, in the research field is look, take, look at these benchmarks. And as you write a research paper, put your model in these benchmarks and put your implementations in there so that other researchers can put their implementations and then future research can build upon it and can have a really honest comparison. And you can use any benchmark that you feel like. I think this is a general good direction to take. And yeah. Yeah, good call. Great. Any, anybody I'd else? Just have like one I, so I think that the benchmarks are great. And, and at the same time, I think there's so much value in solving new problems with probabilistic programming. And, and so I'm really keen to set up some new collaborations and things on interesting new problems. So please do reach out if you're interested in, in working on some cool things. I have one too, uh, short one. Um, I think we should, as a community, think how, the, how teaching of programming as an activity has to change and improve for probabilistic programming languages to have impact. Because teaching programming is hard as is and not fully understand. And the idea that probabilistic programming has a you know impact on the world and so like impacts the, like real world decisions. That we somehow teach what we are actually teach people what we're actually doing. That's great. Um I think uh it Daniel, if you, um, unless you have a, a particular uh, yeah, something just, related just to Stan. Just contribute to open source if you can. Um, Stan's always willing to have people come and contribute. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I, that was super interesting to me anyway. Um, I hope that every um, everyone here at the conference uh, got a lot out of it. We'll see you for another one tomorrow morning um, and at the developer meetup this afternoon. And I'm so appreciative uh, that each of you uh, could join, uh, join us um, and uh, share your thoughts.